to learn how to give Bible studies better. So we get better training and uh, winning souls and um, evangelizing and speaking to people and witnessing. My church family, they asked me to come actually to try to learn something new to uh, help me get uh, more active in my church. Because my pastor threatened to club me if I didn't. <laughs> I came to Emmanuel because I knew that I needed to be able to be more comfortable to reach other people for Jesus. I wasn't even really sure I wanted to come. And so, but it's been such a blessing. I am so thankful God worked it all out that I came. I really enjoyed doing the Bible studies and getting the training on that. I like the idea that every session in the morning began with a doctrinal topic that jump-started in me the need that I needed to share that with someone else. Going through the Bible study lab, it was, uh, it got me out of my comfort zone and now I feel more comfortable uh, doing a Bible study with anybody. I've never actually sat down and given a Bible study to anybody and being able to actually sit down and actually give a Bible study in a classroom setting makes it a lot easier. I came here, <laughs> getting emotional, I came here thinking I was a failure. I had a lot of different things. And during one of the first meetings, um, whew, one of the things that um, I heard was that the only failure there is, is if you don't go out and do anything. I, I wouldn't have gone and given Bible studies had I not come here. If somebody in my church was interested in coming or just pondering it, I would really recommend it. I would definitely recommend for other people to come. If you want to increase your knowledge to share the love of Jesus, this is the absolute place you need to go. By all means, go. You will really appreciate it. I'd tell them to get in their car and come on up. Absolutely, because uh, it's, it's, not, it's going past your own discomfort to help so many other people in the world. It's an experience that until you go through it yourself, you just, yeah, you just can't put words to it. And so, um, come. I'm Cameron DeBasher. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're now on the fourth lesson of our In the Crucible with Christ quarter. This lesson is entitled, Seeing the Goldsmith's Face. This seems to be a reference back to the development of character, looking yes, into Jesus. Is. And you put together our talking points this week, so you kind of give us a little overview before we have a prayer. You know, I won't, I, I, I don't know how much to say. I haven't looked ahead in the lesson far enough. I mm -hmm. would assume, I guess, and I have assumed in this lesson, but I didn't look ahead, that Malachi 3 would be brought up where it talks about how the Sitting Lord comes refiner. to his temple and sits as a refiner of silver. And I think of that because now the lesson talks about a refiner of gold, and I've often used the similar story that's shared in the lesson that it's said that a refiner knows when the refining process is done because he can see his reflection in the metal, all the impurities are removed. Mm. And so this is the idea of seeing the goldsmith's face, you know, referring to the Lord, that the Lord is the goldsmith. The Lord mm. is the one working out our characters. And as he is allowing and controlling and even leading us into trials, as we've learned in previous lessons, he's watching and overseeing the whole process. Mm. And he knows it's done when he sees his reflection. And this is what this lesson is about, the reflection Amen. of God's character in those he is refining. Okay, well, how about uh, you're the one who put together the talking points, like I said, this week. So how about I'll start with prayer, then you walk us through point by point. Fantastic. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of knowing you and being in a community of faith where we can discuss you and study your word and by your grace become more like you. Please bless now this preparation video. Help it to be a benefit, not only to those who hear it, but through each person, each Sabbath school teacher and participant, the whole body may be built up. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. How many talking points do we have this week? We have three talking points this week. Okay. And uh, this week's lesson considers the role 
of trials and suffering in the sanctification process, the role of the trials. We've touched on this in previous lessons. Okay. Um, a lesson on trials without this week's lesson would be incomplete. This is really kind of an overarching, great controversy view, if you will, okay. of you know the role of trials. Now, the first thing that the lesson highlights on Sunday is, and let's, let me bring up the talking points. Talking point number one is that God's ultimate goal is the restoration of humanity. That's drawn okay. primarily from Sunday's lesson. All Talking right. point number two, understanding God's purposes increases faith in the trial. Okay. That's Monday's lesson Let's primarily. And then the remainder of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, character determines destiny. Mm. We have gone over this point before just because it does. Well, it also seems <laughs> like the bulk of this week's destiny. study goes over that too. So it's, a, it's the big rock yes. in the jar, if you will, this week. And when we're talking about our faith in the Lord in the last days and being ready for Jesus to come, character determines destiny. And, and we see that theme in prophecy and what have you, and we're going to see it in this week's lesson. So, okay. number one, the ultimate goal, God's ultimate goal is the restoration of humanity. Sunday highlights Romans 8.29. And maybe you want to read that there at the top sure. of the lesson on Sunday. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the takeaway point here is that God has a plan, a predestination, if you will, that his followers be conformed to the image of his son. This is mm. his goal for humanity. That's how he made us in the beginning. And when sin entered the picture, God, dis God determined that he was going to restore humanity to that original plan. If you would read for us Education, page 15, I have the quote right there. This tells sure. us that in so many words. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. The great object of life, the plan of redemption, the object of education, to restore in man the mm. image of God's maker, to bring him back completely, uh, not just in the words Ellen White used to John Harvey Kellogg as a culprit barely pardoned into the kingdom Ooh. of God, but as a conqueror. God wants full restoration of humanity. And, and interestingly, and it looks like you're yeah, open there. Well, you're still in Romans chapter yes. 8. There's reference, and earlier in the same passage, this is alluded to again, and you have it in the notes, verses 18 and 19. Yes. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to, worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. And then it says, in us. Yeah. You know, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Well, but, let's pause there for a sure. minute. Let's just clarify that glory oftentimes, not in every indication or in mm -hmm. every case in the Bible, but glory oftentimes refers to God's character. Yes. And Ellen White says that uh, as well. God's glory dash his character. Is yeah, she'll literally in, insert it in uh, the passage sometimes. And so, and this is the context Paul's talking in, the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, this is, oftentimes we think, at least I can... Think of times where, as a Christian, I would think that the glory of God that's waiting to be revealed is like on the eastern sky, you know, the size right. of it, like the bursting, shimmery shininess of his coming, which, of course, there's that element of glory, too. But right. that's not what his appeal is no. here. He's talking about the reveal. It's going to be revealed in me, not that's just right. in front of and me. And so they, that revealed word is going to be important in the rest of the passage. And incidentally, this should take us right to Revelation 14, where it says, mm -hmm. fear God and give him glory. So mm -hmm. when you think about glory, glory is what he has. Glory, like you said, is what we're going to see, this resplendent glory. But how do you give glory to yeah. God? How is it going to be in me to give to him, right? And well, this is what the Paul's passage continues, says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Not the Son of God, capital S, singular, right. like waiting for the second coming, but it's waiting for the glory of God to be seen in right. his own people. And so I said that word, he, he says the whole creation is waiting for the revealing. Well, the revealing is talked about in the first verse, the glory which shall be revealed mm -hmm. in us. In us. Right? And the whole creation is waiting for that revealing, that unveiling, yes. if you will, that mm. sometime future that the apostle is referring mm. to where God's glory will be seen in his people. Which is exactly where he goes at the end of the passage. We already saw, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, right? That's that exactly all right. of those who are redeemed will be in character like Jesus. 
That's right. And so I put in the notes, God's glory or character is to be revealed in humanity and all creation is awaiting this momentous event. Just mm. a summary there of those verses in Romans. Now, what's interesting is, and a lot of people seem to miss this, and I don't know why, it's such a clear theme in scripture that the sin of humanity and I put has brought in the notes, I probably should put brings. Mm. The sin of humanity brings reproach upon God and the obedience of humanity glorifies his name. And we'll demonstrate that in two passages. You're there in Romans 2, or in Romans. Yep. Look at Romans 2.24 and then I'll go to Matthew 5.16. Okay. The lesson doesn't bring out Romans 2.24, but I do believe it brings up Matthew 5.16. Okay, well, Romans chapter 2, verse 21, 4 says, verse 24 says, yeah. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Now, if you read the context of that passage, God's professed people, he says, you who uh, um, abhor idols, do you rob temples? Right. You who uh, boast in the law, do you dishonor it's God? It's an indictment by against the Jewish the people law. who uphold the law so far, but they're not actually living right. it. Right. And so he, he points out the fact that you're not obeying God despite your profession, and in doing so, you're reproaching, bringing reproach mm. upon his or name. Blaspheming his name among the Gentiles. And so on the one hand, we see that our disobedience to God, our sin brings reproach on his name because we call ourselves by his name. Whereas Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 16 to his disciples, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Mm. Uh, obviously because we don't have good works of our own. And when we manifest good works, it's evidence of God's glory working in us. And so... Uh, Jesus says, let your light so shine that when people see your good works, they glorify mm -hmm. God. So the takeaway is the sin of humanity brings reproach to God. Yes, that's the thing. And obedience glorifies his name. Right, that, that there is, regardless of the mechanism, how the fact of the matter is, according to scripture, God's name can either be extolled and elevated and praised and glorified, or it can be downtrodden and blasphemed and, and smeared based and on right. somehow everybody looking at us. Well, why don't you read that statement there uh, from Sunday's lesson? Well, I have it here in a handout, too, from yeah. Desire of Ages 671. The lesson shares this statement and then asks, what do you think Ellen White means by this statement? Why don't you <laughs> it says, the very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Now, perhaps somebody would read that and scratch their head and say, you know, like the lesson, what is, what is this getting at? What does Ellen White mean by this? But when we look at the two texts we just looked at, right. in Romans 2 and Matthew 5, now we see exactly what it's saying. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people because the character of his people and their subsequent actions mm -hmm. either bring reproach to his name or they bring honor to his name. So he's right. dishonored when we are so, unfaithful. And that's the point. When we take the name of Christ, we're either forwarding his work or, or hindering it. We're either for or against, but we're, we're strapped in now because we've called ourselves his and he's called us. So that's we've right. got this. I know, I know, I know Christians, I know Seventh-day Adventist Christians who don't like that idea. It's like it puts too much on us, but I think sometimes we put too little on us. Mm. Like you're the one that chose to take his name and granted it is not by our own strength or it is not we not in our in and of ourselves mm -hmm. perfectly righteous but if we are crucified with christ in the words of the apostle paul can you say paul saying you know in galatians 2 i'm crucified with christ uh, i no longer live but christ lives in me but i really don't live that well and uh, <laughs> yeah. i mean his whole point is i live a whole different life now because christ lives in me right. and that's the way it should be in Christian amen life. and and i think when the gentiles think about that they're expecting, hey, if this God is truly powerful, let's see it demonstrated. And where are they going to see it, right? It's not just in the profession, but it's in the follow through it's in the character of his people. Exactly. So the lesson asks a real probing uh, question on the bottom of Sunday. Imagine, it's the very bottom of the page, imagine being on the field of a huge stadium, sitting on the bleachers on one side are heavenly beings loyal to the Lord, on the other side are beings who have fallen with Lucifer. If your life for the past 24 hours were played out on the field, which side would you have more to cheer about? Mm. <laughs> that's a, that's a, you know, I think again, we've gone somebody, from preaching to meddling there. But. Somebody's going to say you're putting too much on humanity, but there's a level where we have to, act, we are to some degree, brothers and sisters, accountable for the lives we live as followers of Christ. Mm. And there's this mindset today, like we're not accountable for anything. 
Well, and uh, so it's a good question. I if think. I could interject one text too that I always think of when we talk yes. about this is, is, is Ephesians chapter three, mm -hmm. and it's verse ten where it talks about how um, God's intent is now that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So the, the imagine scenario there of imagine that there's a field yes. to play that the good and the bad are watching. Well, we don't have to imagine. Yes. The Bible says that th this is exactly what God has done is put us on display. In another place, he talks That's about right. a spectacle, a theatron, right? Yeah. The lesson brings both of those verses up. We didn't read the First Corinthians okay. 4, 9 is yes. that one. And Ephesians 3, 10, when they ask, how do you understand what Ellen White said to us in the quote? They reference those verses. So exactly. Have them so, in the lesson. And I wanted to underscore the fact that this isn't like, oh, you took one Ellen White quote. No, 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 no. This is a biblical principle that Ellen White's trying to articulate clearly, and we have well, to we apply. just saw it in Romans, Ephesians, <laughs> and, right. and uh, Matthew, and 1 Corinthians 4, among yeah, other places. All so over the place. We haven't talked about Job yet. Let's get there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you go to, well, uh, and very quickly, because, well, yeah, we're going to Job, a little bit on Job. Understanding number two, talking point number two, understanding God's purpose increases faith in the trial. Now, the lesson highlights the experience of Job mm -hmm. on Monday. And of course, it goes to Job 23. There's a lot of things you could look at in the life of Job and other places, but they highlight Job 23. And there's a couple things that I want to point out in Job 23. Job, the essence of Job 23 is Job basically saying that he's, as he's looking for the Lord and trying to understand his purpose, he can't find God. Mm. He wants to have a conversation with him and because he knows then he could understand some things, but he can't find him wherever <laughs> he's looking. And so there's a couple things in light of all that that I want to highlight, because we're not going to read the whole passage sure. here. Um, I would encourage you to do it in Sabbath school class, but Job 23, why don't you read verses 7 through 10? Okay. Uh, Job 23, 7 through 10. There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. Verse 10. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So it's a fascinating passage to me in that, number one, Job has questions. He can't fully discern the purposes of God. He's looking for him, but when God's working, he doesn't know what he's doing. When he works, verse 9, on the left hand, I cannot behold him. I can't see him. I don't know what he's doing. When he turns to the right, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, though Job couldn't perceive God's presence, he still trusted in his leading. Mm. He knows the way that I take, even though I don't know the way that I take. And when it's all said and done, mm -hmm. I'm going to come forth as gold. Right. He's going to accomplish what... And then the other element of this is back in verse 7 where he says, There the upright would reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. In other words, God's righteous, he's holy, he's going to do the right thing when it's said and done, even though I don't mm. understand why everything's happening. So, once again, though Job couldn't perceive God's presence, he still trusted in God's leading mm. and in God's righteous ways. Mm. And he knows that the end result for him is that he's going to be like gold. That's that right. not only is he going to leave me and he knows the end, but I know, it's like saying, I don't know the route he's going to take me or the process, mm -hmm. but I know here's where I am now and that's when I'm going to be then. That's right. And in between, that's on Hold him. On. <laughs> but I but know I at the end belt. it's going to be gold at the end, right? That's exactly and right. That's confidence. Yeah. And so again, the talking point is that understanding God's purpose has increases faith Amen. in the trial. Uh, as Job is going through these things, because he knew God, mm -hmm. he could trust him. And despite what he didn't know, he could hang on. And there's a great point that I found uh, a comment by Dr. Albert Barnes in his comments on Job 23, verse 14. And uh, verse 14 says, thick clouds cover him. So that's not right. I said, he, for what he performs, I'm sorry, Job 23, 14. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. And the idea is, Whatever he's doing, whatever I'm going through, God's appointed that for me. He saw mm -hmm, this necessary mm -hmm. for me, and many such things are with him. I'm not the only one. God does this with lots of people in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. And so, in other words, God's in charge of the trials. We've looked at this in, I think, last week's lesson. But Barnes says this as he comments, I had rather be afflicted 
feeling that it is, in other words, go through a trial, feeling that it is part of a plan calmly and deliberately formed by God, then that is the result of some unexpected and uncontrollable cause. Mm. I had infinitely rather be under the operation of a plan or decree where there may be a reason for all that is done, though I cannot see it, than to feel that I am subject to the tossings of blind chance where there can possibly be no reason. Mm. Now imagine the trials of life were just, uh, nobody knows. But when you have the faith that whatever we're going through, God is in control of the refining fire, and in the end, when he has tested me, I'll come forth as gold. That changes your whole perspective on the trial. I have to interject one text in here. And this is 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Speaking mm -hmm. of all this, he, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, mm -hmm. and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, That's right. reference to the second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is Job's comment all yeah. over again. Like, I don't know where I'm headed next, but I do know that the at the end I'm going to be gold. Yes. And here I'm going to be like Jesus. And thus he says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This purifying fire that I'm going to be tried and come out. Then we can trust that God knows what's best for us. He sees what we don't. The one thing we know is that though we're here... He's promised to get us there. That's exactly right. Mm. And so the lesson then takes us into this concept of the importance of developing character. Yes. In, in the context we're looking at. Uh, number three, talking point number three, character determines destiny. Tuesday's lesson highlights the parable of the ten virgins. And uh, most of us are familiar with that. And oftentimes the, the, when we just look at the parable of the ten virgins and you've got these, they're all virgins so they all they represent people with a pure faith yeah all 10 of them and they all slumbered and slept yep. right and all of them had oil and all of them had lamps and we typically define the well, oil and you know what you could do i bet mm -hmm. to have a school teacher i shouldn't say i bet i would um guess Wait, wager <laughs> no i can't say that either no. <laughs> If you were to open this up and go through the, yes. just briefly the parable of the ten virgins and what say, does the oil all right, what, yeah, just break it down. What does it represent? What, is the lamp? what does that represent? What does the really? virgin represent? And when you get to the oil, I would be willing to guess that most people are going to say, and it's not necessarily incorrect, not at all. that the Holy Spirit is the oil. That's that right. That's what it represents. And that's absolutely true. It's not absolutely in the sense that it's entirely true. It is in part true, but there's another application of the oil. Well, it's, yeah, it's the application of the oil. So the lesson asks the question, and I'm so glad they do, in what way, in what ways does the meaning of the story change of this mm -hmm. parable, depending on whether you see oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit or of the possession of character. So now the lesson suggests mm -hmm. the oil rep having to do with the possession of character. Like you don't have just oil, you have character. And I think the, the distinction is, okay, so the lamp represents the Bible and the oil represents the Holy Spirit, but we often don't think of what does that mean in a practical sense in the life of the Christian? Mm -hmm. Like when I have the Bible and the Holy Spirit, what What's is it that? do to the virgin? That's like, exactly how those right. Two, yeah. And that those two things work together for the formation of character. There it is. And uh, we'll see that in inspiration as well. So the question is asked, what's the difference if you see it just as, you know, the Holy Spirit out here or the development of character? How does that change the story? Well, obviously, if you take it to the, just the Holy Spirit as a, as a quantifiable entity, well, apparently you can run out. And then it can't be given. Mm -hmm. It can't be shared. And, and that's a little bit troublesome, right? If you say, well... Or you can get extra. Or, yeah, you can sort up early. So, yeah. But if you see it in view of character, well, then it would make total sense why at the last minute you can't just glom onto someone else's and get some of the leftovers and it, it changes the perspective. Well, when you talk about the Holy Spirit and, you know, the, it could run out, because we have no control over the Holy Spirit, for the most part, I mean, you know, the Spirit goes where He wills, yeah. the Bible says, and does what He wills. And so I, if I'm out, I'm out. Yeah. And God's going to have to supply, but he can do that at any old time in right. the blink of, a, of an eye. Um, but when you understand that that oil represents in this parable the work that the Holy Spirit does there you go. in sanctification, in development of character, that is not something that can happen mm -hmm. in the blink of an eye. And there's a great quote from Ellen White on this Friday. In Friday's lesson, it's, a, it's the second paragraph. You want to read that for us? Sure. Second paragraph of Friday. Let me make sure I get there. It says, 
In the parable, the foolish virgins are represented as begging for oil and failing to receive it at their request. This is symbolic of those who have not prepared themselves by developing a character to stand in a time of crisis. It is as if they should go to their neighbors and say, Give me your character or I shall be lost. The, the, those that were wise could not impart their oil to the flickering lamp of the foolish virgins. Character is not transferable. It is not to be bought or sold. It is to be acquired. The Lord has given to every individual an opportunity to obtain a righteous character through the hours of probation, but he has not provided a way by which one human agent may impart to another the character which he has developed by going through hard experiences, by learning lessons from the great teacher, so that he can manifest patience under trial and exercise faith so that he can remove mountains of impossibility. Awesome statement. So mm. what it does, it, I mean, it makes the parable, it gives it a, a very, um, a sense of urgency, mm. a sense of, uh, what I want to say, uh, 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 there's a, there's a, a, a t I don't want to say a tone of seriousness, but it really makes you look at life differently when you realize that this is the only time we have. Mm. to form character. I can't get it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's only, and notice, what did she say there? The words that, that they form that character by... Oh yeah, by through hard experiences, by learning lessons from the great teacher. Right, how can I take you through my experience? Or right. you take me through your experience? So that you can't transfer that. You have to live a life. Well, let also, the Lord even guide at the last that. moment, there isn't enough time left to go through a thing and That's look exactly back and right. reflect. On, oh, you got to have it now. And you had to have had those lessons beforehand. And incidentally, that is Jesus' whole point of telling that parable. It's yeah, what's the context readiness. of it? It's readiness for the and second coming. And at the coming, end, right? some are going to be, the door is going to be shut and they're going to be left on the outside. Mm. Ellen White makes another statement. I have it here in the in the uh, handout, Patriarchs and Prophets 2.23. In fact, we came from the story of Joseph from last quarter. Character is not inherited. It cannot be bought. Moral excellence and fine mental qualities are not the result of accident. Mm -hmm. The most precious gifts are of no value unless they are improved. The formation of a noble character is the work of a lifetime. Now, that's interesting because we always talk about sanctification, but this mm -hmm. same thing. The work of for the formation of a noble character is the work of a lifetime and must be the result of diligent and persevering effort. God gives opportunities. Success depends upon the use made of them. Mm -hmm. So the, the parable is in Matthew 25 is pointing to that. And the lesson goes on, and for sake of time, we're going to move past it, but it goes on in, in uh, Matthew 25 to talk about the sheep and the goats and how th what mm -hmm. you have there is a manifestation of the characters they built. That's exactly right. And we see the same thing. Uh, the lesson goes into the life of Daniel on uh, Wednesday about that time of the end mm -hmm. where some will be, many will be made white, purified and refined. Mm -hmm. And so you have a purification. The time of the end is going to be a time of a purification process. And there's a statement there that Ellen White makes. Uh, could you read that from us from Letters Manuscripts number 17? Sure. And it's referenced in the handout. She quotes Daniel 12, 7 to 10, and then and she And then says, comments, saying, The world has not been given into the hands of men, though God is permitting the elements of confusion and disorder to bear sway for a season. Uh, we who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. God permits men to work out the purposes he would have saved them from had they kept his commandments. To those who fulfill God's purpose for them will be spoken the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. The human machinery has been used to do a work that is a blessing to humanity, and God is glorified. Mm. That's just a powerful statement. We don't have time to delve into a lot of it, but that sentence, those who fulfill God's purpose, I'm sorry, uh, God permits men to work out the purposes he would have saved them from had they kept his commandments. Mm. I believe some of those people will yet be saved and some Amen. will be lost. But the point is, in, there's a display. We've, this is what we've looked at in this lesson. Like there's this display going on. There's a playing field right. and God lets us work out our purposes and the whole universe is seeing, wow, if he would have followed what God said, <laughs> well, and, it would have gone better. But they're right. If he would have followed what God says, but God then takes those people who've made the mistakes and says, yeah, but watch what I can do That's in them. Like, exactly right. So it's good if you don't fall, but even if you do fall, we can fix you up. It's great. Well, the last point that, that uh, I'll touch on briefly here, and I would probably spend more time in class, but we're almost out of time here, is that, mm. is that the lesson brings up character and community on Thursday, and it goes into Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, we always talk about... The, how Jesus gave some to be apostles and some prophets mm -hmm. and demands. We talk about these spiritual gifts that Jesus gave to the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And we've trained on this many times from a standpoint yes. of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. 
But it's interesting as that passage goes further into verses 15 and 16, it talks about how every joint uh, works, every part does its share in the body, all these different gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, Caesar, etc., mm -hmm. to help bring us all to the unity of the faith and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, Christian community is designed to further develop our characters and ultimately demonstrate mm. the wisdom of God's plan as the world beholds the church. And mm -hmm. you brought this up, Ephesians 3.10, the manifold right. wisdom of God is the made known by, by the church. previous chapter, by the way, contextually, it's Jesus in, the same in John idea. 13 says we're going to know, people will know, know we're disciples because of our love. And so, um, as much as we may, <laughs> the lesson asks the question, what ways of in what way is the witness of a community different from the witness of an individual? My first thought was, sometimes it's a lot easier to be a Christian by myself, right? <laughs> or at least uh, it's better to feel like D you're Doug a Christian. Doug Batchelor yeah. has said before that you ask the question, you know what the problem is with the church? There's people in it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so and the true. problem is, we, we got to get, and there's something about getting along with one another. Yes. And that is also, some of our greatest trials are in the church. Right, but if you look but at the context of Ephesians 4 there, when it talks about growing up in all things into him who is the head, like we're growing up into the image of Jesus, yes. and that's why we're put in this situation, so that mm. each will contribute to that. And while it may feel better to not be hassled and bothered yes. by the... Uh, but it's not best for me. It's That's best right. for me to be in the body of Christ and through his grace become like Jesus himself. That too was one of the places God led or leads us is into, into the, the church. church. Have mercy. Um, <laughs> with the good and the bad. One conclusion from Education 225, I want to share this statement. Ellen White says, Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. Hmm. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before were young men and young women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. So if there was ever a time when this mm. is relevant, it, it is, is now. That's right. Friends, we pray that the Lord will bless every Sabbath school class and let's close with prayer even now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these tremendous scriptures that give us such hope and such clarity about your purpose for each one of us. You want on us all, not only to survive this life, but through the trials and difficulties to become like Jesus. So Lord, bless us to that end and help every one of us to have that walk with you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. 